David, you're referring to um, public, um, a public, I don't even know what to say, but I shouldn't speak. It's Chris's turn to introduce us. Just uh, <laughs> listening to the applause over here. It's uh, seven o'clock in New York, so uh, now's the time for applause. I love it. My dog goes crazy every time. I had to put her in the other room, but she's, it's, it, it's, her, it's the most exciting moment of the day for her. And All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, looks like uh, people are filing in uh, to the uh, to the webinar. Uh, we're very excited to be uh, launching Figure It Out by Wayne Kestenbaum tonight. Um, everybody's got their copies. Um, so this is welcome everyone to this is Powerhouse Arena's virtual events uh, series. This is our second event. Uh, my name is Chris, and I'm very excited to be hosting the launch uh, Figured Out. We are very proud to have it uh, at our store, and we're thrilled to give it a digital home for the time being. Uh, you can buy the book at powerhousebookstores.com. Uh, the, the link is in the event page, and I'll repost it in the chat. Uh, Wayne will be joined in conversation by David Velasco, and I'll introduce them both now. David Velasco is the editor-in-chief of Art Forum. Uh, Wayne Kustenbaum is a poet, critic, and artist. His books include The Queen's Throat, Opera, Homosexuality, and the Mystery of Desire, which is a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. Jackie Under My Skin, Interpreting an Icon, My 1980s and Other Essays, Humiliation, Circus, Hotel Theory, The Pink Trance Notebooks, and Camp Marmalade. Uh, you'll be able to ask questions through the function on your screen, and I'll, I'll hand it over now. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. And thank you, Powerhouse. And now we're, David, it's just us in this strange room of the virtual and the, I don't even know what noun to put in that slot. I think we're alone now. But we're also, I, I feel like we're being watched. It's so creepy. It's really, um, I feel like it's something you'd write about in your books really beautifully. Um, I have to say, uh, so I, you know, I've been reading this since I got my copy a month ago. I reread it again yesterday. It is, it's very hard to jump into a book like this because it is so lush. It is so filled with glory. It's like, I feel like it's, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't think I'm overselling it to feel like it's like, say it's like a spell book for enlightenment. It's like you are, it's, it's a series of incantations and spells and ethics, um, each of which is delivered so deliciously that it's, it's, it's like you want, you want to, you want to, I don't know, you want to read it and then go experience the world in the way you've experienced it. I, so I, I, it's weird to talk about a book like this because you should just read the book. But I have, um, you know, we're here to talk about the book, to talk about you, to talk about your writing. And um, I, I wonder, I want, okay, I prepared you for this because in the book, there's a lot of dream talk. You use dreams um, regularly. Um, as some sort of digression or to, I don't know, actually, I don't know why and how you're using dreams, but clearly you dream a lot. And I wanted to know what you dreamt last night or, yeah. What did you dream last night? Tell me what your dreams are. And David, so I, I could talk, there'd be so much that I could say just about why dreams and how they enter my writing and why they matter to me and why you two dream and how tips I could give you to find your dreams and make use of them. Um, but um, I didn't, last night, I don't know, I was so nervous about this. I don't think I dreamt at all or I woke up. Um, I hear a little voice in the back. Do you hear that? I do. Where is that? Is somebody not muted? There's total, there's three video participants. Okay, I think I hear, or oh, whatever, I'm not going to fine tune this. I'm going to go into my dream. But I do feel like I hear, maybe from Katie, 
I don't know who else is here. Whatever. I'll just go on, right? Just go on. Okay. I try. Just do it, right? Don't be self-conscious about the threshold. Um, I try that somebody deposited outside an apartment of mine. I only have one apartment, but it might have been an apartment of the past. Somebody deposited a moldering violin. It might not have been moldering. It was certainly useless, and it was certainly now my responsibility. And with this violin, there was also a manuscript I, and some photographs. I had to send the violin, the manuscript, and the photographs to somewhere in the Midwest. But you know what? I discovered that the person who was going to receive them in the Midwest didn't even really care about them. And yet I felt ter terrifically burdened by this bequest. And so, and I'll just say one more thing. In the dream, the violin that was outside morphed into a violin that was inside my apartment, but a different violin that came kind of from a tree trunk in the process of being molded into a sculpture, the way that Michelangelo's, you know, unfinished sculptures look. So I guess it was, if you were to go through the dream, you would say violin, manuscript, unwanted gift. Do you think you'll ever use this in writing or is this now it's just? I think I will, uh, yeah, no, I would, I would definitely use it. This, I would, I would, I will use it. In fact, I will take this, David, as an assignment from you that I need to use the violin. The question is, of course, whether the violin in the dream still has a function or whether it's an archaic technology. Is it like a Super 8 camera, which I'm actually now really fond of using? Or is it like this Olivetti typewriter? A bundle of useless nerves. Do you even play the violin? I know you play the piano. I don't. No, my brother plays the cello and I play the piano. I think once in maybe like 10th grade, I heard um, Paganini's first violin concerto and I thought, this is so beautiful. I wished I had learned violin and I wished it very strongly that day. A strong enough wish that it still lights up the decades ever since. <laughs> and channel yourself into your dream. Yeah. From the other night. I, I want to actually ask about your, where you are right now. You mm -hmm. are, can we talk about where you are? Is anything Absolutely. Possible? Yes. Okay. So you are in Germantown, correct? Yes. And you are in a space that is not typically a space where you do book launches. Right. I do a little Zoom. I do a little Zoom teaching here. I do, I've done writing here since 1999 on the weekends. Um, this room has been the repository of my archive, which is no longer here. You can't see it here, but there's like, like tons of poetry books and there are um, spiritual books and movie star biographies behind me. And there are strange bits of ephemera from my past, but it's a room, as I said to you before, it's a room for regression, not for progression. And so it feels like oddly the dream of wearing your pajamas to school or on stage, to be seen, to be caught, to be caught in this room, yeah. launching. <laughs> Are we launching? I think we're launching, David, whatever that implies. But you know, I, was, I want to say one thing that when you said that you felt stimulated by my book, to go experience the world differently, for which that for that praise, I thank you so much. But I also wanted to say that in the book, in the essay, which was published in art form, my masculinity remix, I described the sensation of going to Cheryl Donegan's retrospective at the New Museum and really grooving on uh, the design and the fabrics and um, the pop-up shop where you can click and buy something, and then going out into the streets of New York and feeling, as I put it in the book, I think, educated by dizziness, and that having been taught by Cheryl Donegan's work to appreciate parallelograms and intersections and varieties of decor. And I, I say there, and, it's, and I really still believe this, that 
you know, I used to maybe earlier in life want to recover from dizziness, but I now maybe court it and consider it a, a source of tutelage. Yeah. You court, I mean, that's, that's something that you, that's one of the things that I love about the book is that you tend to, I mean, courting is like, there is a way in which you are uh, retrieving these things that have often been devalued um, immaturity, irresponsibility, uh, dizziness, dreams, and you're, you're giving them, um, you're burnishing them for us so that we maybe can feel okay indulging in them. Or maybe it's not an indulgence. I don't know. I, I, I mentioned this earlier that there's a way in which you, your announcement that you go toward, you go toward your responsibility or that you have this kind of, uh, maybe you just don't have any choice, but to go, it's not, it's like, it's just how you are. Um, and that at the same time, this doesn't make you unserious. Right. So there's, there's this constant tension throughout the book of you finding ways to allow yourself to inhabit these like spaces of like Nietzschean play, but in a way that's, still has rules or you're all you're always you're always looking for rules and then pushing past them and looking for rules and pushing past them and that that tension that collision is so fertile i like it's just like i mean i so i i guess i'm curious if there's a rule that you've imposed on yourself recently that you feel has been particularly useful i mean right now in these spaces of regression, like I feel like I, I can't speak for everyone, but I think it's not an uncommon experience for us to be in spaces of regression. Like I'm doing this from my office slash living room slash second bedroom for like friends who come and stay. It's not a space that I yet use to articulate um, anything really. It's deep. Yeah, certainly. Um, but it's, you know, but that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like you can, you can transform these spaces. You can actually do that work or these collisions can be places for liftoff if you accept them in a certain way. And that's actually what I think is when I, when I, I keep thinking that you're kind of this enlightened being because there's an acceptance that, um, that, uh, that comes when you, uh, it's like you're willing to take the bad and then still transform it. And that's, that, I don't know what else enlightenment is, honestly. Well, I'm not enlightened, but, but who is? Even the enlightened people aren't enlightened. Not so right. Maybe I am secretly enlightened, but I think you can take it from me. And I think David, you have enough experience in me to know that you probably, I'm probably, I'm too envious, too paranoid, too, um, I was going to say tropic, but I mean filled with tropism toward dizziness. But yeah. um, I want to answer kind of generally the things that you proposed there. First about, in a way, dreams, and then about rules, and then about irresponsibility and my tropism toward it. I was going to say the only rules for me come from the sentence. And as I think I say many times in this book, sentences come with very strict rules. And I don't just mean um, the difference between a complete sentence and a sentence fragment or issues of dangling modifiers and all that, but the rules of sequence and that there's always an order for the thoughts and that they end with usually a period or something that closes the sentence off and allows you to retroactively look at it and judge it in a sense. And that, the, that whenever I step into a sentence, I am very tightly bound by rules, and I'm usually in a, a state of emergency um, because I'm trying to find my way out of the sentence, trying to put in it something that is worth putting in it. And so the, the reason that I, in a way, advertise my irresponsibility or immaturity, but I'm secretly serious, and the reason I might use that dream of the violin is that when I'm inside a sentence, um, I want to fill it with the thing that really matters. And I have always this sense as I'm writing the sentence, 
even though I wish I could be a person who would fill the sentence with different, loftier things, I have to give you the dream because that's the best I have to offer you. And so I usually, um, I let myself drift into autobiography, memory, free association, which is never free, linguistic fall, because I want to really, I want to, um, not because I'm moral that I wish to give you something like this. I, I want to, I want to get out of the sentence alive. And to get out of it alive, I have to deposit there something um, worth picking up. And slightly a different way of saying um, the best parts of me are the junk of me, or the best parts of my thinking come from the junk part of my thinking. Um, Interesting. I know how to recognize the impulse in me when I'm writing or speaking that's, that understands in a kind of um, necromantic divining rod way, where is the subterranean heat, you know? And that comes from erotic, the heat comes from erotic longing, nostalgia, yearning for the impossible, um, a sudden kindling forth of a thing that had been forgotten until that moment. And you give space and life to all of those things. And you're not afraid to interrupt them because you know that for them to have a life, sometimes they have to be interrupted. Because of my chemistry as a writer, I have to do it that way. It's, it's, but it really, it's, I'm not being coy when I say this. Is if I'm thinking, let's pretend I'm that violinist. And let's say, okay, the violinist wants to get up there and play a Bach Chacon. But what if that violinist sounds lousy when he, she, whatever plays the Bach Chacon, the violinist will find something else from the junk bag to play so that people don't throw tomatoes. It's just, it's a kind of last ditch attempt to be presentable. And that's where, that's where the, um, the so-called indulgences in my writing come from. Yeah. Fear, thriftiness, Wanting to use up what's in my larder, wanting to find the good, the, the non spoiled goods in my larder. Non spoiled goods. Yeah, find the good stuff. I'm not going to give you like the split peas that I had at the beginning of the quarantine that I thought I forgot to look at the date. They could have been 20 years old. They tasted 20 years old. I was starting almost to like Google, you know, die from old beans. <laughs> and but the thing is, that, well, I could go on and on about that. I'm gonna, David, you say something I mean, do. You know, for people who are going to buy this book, there's an incredible essay in here among the many incredible essays. This is an essay collection. Um, some of the work has been published, just to give some background, but um, a significant part of it has not. Um, but there's an essay called Punctuation in which you really, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's in some ways, it's, it's it's, a, it's trippy to read because you're, of course, analyzing punctuation as you're using it in this, in this way that's so quick. And it's like, it's like, as I said, it's like waves lapping at a beach or something. It's like you kind of, you come, you come through it and then you like have to retreat and like look back at what you just read as you're reading it. It's like, it creates this um, very unstable uh, um, sense of readership, but not in a way that's like too meta either. It's like, it's very, um, you know, it's still, is trained toward this, uh, toward this uh, enjoyment and um, um, and just lyricism that makes you want to continue. Like it's not, there's nothing, there's no, there's never a chore in your writing. <laughs> that is something that I'm always very grateful for. Um, but one other thing, I mean, you, so you, you talk about, of course, the sentence, but you're also, this book is, it's consists mostly of, uh, this word that I didn't know before, and I probably should, but I, you know, I don't know a lot of things, and I'm always learning th things from you. But the, um, is the crot, which is a, um, um, it's, it's a, it's a term that you learned from John Barth, uh, who was uh, uh, your student of at one point. Um, a, a crot, as I'm just, I'll read it here because I also I looked it up on. Uh, in the Oxford English Dictionary, and I and they didn't have much there, so I feel like you're the the main source of the crot. <laughs> um, but a crot is a 
separable unit like a paragraph without connection to the units before or after it. Each crot is its own event. We leap from crot to crot at liberty. Connections arise through juxtaposition, not through direct statement or overt linkage. And that's, this is a, this is, it's a moment. It's a moment when you put, you know, there's a crot where you describe the crot and it kind of functions as a, a little, it's like one of the many little keys in the book to be like, oh, right. Everything else in this book has this relationship to the crop. You know, it's, it's um, uh, no longer, I mean, you read the book up until that point a little consecutively, like one crop to the next and the frictions and juxtapositions are there, you know, in between each individual item. But then by the time you reach this, you know, three quarters of the way through the book, this like idea of the crop, you suddenly have to kind of recalibrate and look back and think, oh, all of this is in relationship to one another. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, why did you, like, did you go into this book, figure it out, with the idea that you wanted the crop to be an essential uh, device? Or was this something that, like, just emerged more organically through your writing or, you know, however? I can't see you on my screen. <laughs> is that Steve? Yeah, Steve just said he can't see me on his screen. <gasps> I don't know if other, if like the, uh, Chris, you want to say whether I'm invisible? Well, I hope I'm seen by other people. So somebody, somebody in the chat from Powerhouse say, David, can you see me? I can see you. Okay. You I am seen. seen. Okay, I'm seen. Maybe there's some kind of like apotropaic thing going on in this house where it's like best, best that the boyfriend doesn't see. And, there's some, something going on in the universe around that that we will get to later. But, um, crops, so it's, it's, okay, now he can see me. All is right with the universe. Okay, good, okay. David, the crot, okay. Uh, and I may have told this story before, so forgive me if I have, but that the, um, I, I, well, I entered the writing or the compiling and the putting together and figure it out knowing that the crop would be its method, because basically at this point in life, I am 100% crop. I don't do I don't do continuous paragraphs. I kind of stopped doing them in 1993 when I wrote The Queen's Throat, which was originally in consecutive paragraphs, and I took it apart literally and broke it into numbered paragraphs to make it decent, to make it readable, and to make it true rather than um, faux Foucauldian. Um, not that Foucault and Kratz are incompatible, they're not. But um, I fell in love with Kratz. I, I discovered them in the early 80s, in 1981, but I fell in love with them, I think, in 1985, when I read for the first time Michel Lerice's book, Manhood, in Richard Howard's wonderful translation. And there was a part near the beginning where he, um, just, he's talking about childhood memories and he refers to a bitten buttock. And the, the ineradicable force that this bitten buttock had on him. And it's in a crot. And the crot says something like, hurt, cut foot, comma, bitten buttock. And I really had a enlightenment experience in that moment. And I understood that the only way to go about the male body was to cut it up. Cut foot, bitten buttock, cut it up, and then aesthetically, put it in separate boxes. Nothing to do with castration, everything to do with analysis and highlighting the detail. And so, but it really was, I understood, I guess you would call it a homology or a likeness between the sentence, excuse me, between the separable paragraph and the bitten buttock that had been almost torn from the bodily wholeness and, and from the, the whole tapestry of memory and isolated. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm gonna do that from now on. I'm gonna find no matter what I write, I'm gonna find the bitten buttock and I'm gonna give it its own paragraph. <laughs> and believe it or not, this is, it's actually true. I believe it. I believe yeah. It. Um, and and it's also, I think actually the alliteration of that meant a bit to me too, the BT and the BT, bitten buttock. It's, a, you know, and then like later in life, I read 
um, about like monads. And I really got largely through Benjamin. I got on this whole trip that still dominates my writing where the monad in the universe and monad, you know, monodology is homologous with the, the remembering of the body as a sequence of parts like that bitten buttock. I think I'll stop with the bitten buttock unless somebody bites my ass. <laughs> well, we're not reading the Q&A, so we're not. OK, good. We're spared. <laughs> no. Well, of course, you know, you also have, you have a thing for bottom, uh, what is the word for it? Bottom, I have it down here. What is your word for it? Bottom. Bottom nature. Bottom nature? Sure. Of course, bottom nature. Like that's like, you know, you gravitate toward bottom nature. And is that, isn't there a part actually in there where you actually say that the buttock is not, it's, it's, it's you're actually, it's, you're, you like that it's bottom nature, not buttock nature? I yeah, I like bottom, or maybe I say um, the fundament. I say something about the fundament, and I like the word fundament because it expresses the idea of the foundational without dirtying it up with buttocks. But the phrase bottom nature, to give her credit, is Gertrude Stein's, and she's really, and it, it also has to do with memory and repetition, and that in a life we keep repeating in action we keep repeating, we are composed of repetitions, and that our bottom nature is what we repeat. And so, okay, I'm gonna go back to the crop because I am curious. One of the other elements of the crop that it allows you, it allows you to have many observations, but it also allows you to have, it's, it's, it's almost an argument against argument, right? There's something to, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there's an antagonism to the idea of the argument in, in, in figure it out that is, that is almost also its own kind of thesis. Like you are, you know, like, sure, not, not to say that I'm not going to, I don't want to project that you hate argument, but that there's enough passages in here where you're maybe, uh, you're allergic to the idea of, or that you, I don't know, actually, how do you feel about argument? What is, what is your relationship to argument? And do you think that this is, do you agree that the cross is part of your attempt to, to not go there? I probably, I feel like I've said um, and embarrassed myself a lot in writing and in public bio. I, I do often go on and on about how I don't like argument. And then people say, oh, but you do have an argument and all that. So I've kind of like, I'm no longer saying I don't like argument, though I have said that many, many, many times. But I would, what I would say now to you in my, in my maturity, David, I would say that um, the crot, or the way I write in these separable monadic paragraphs, is, um, is a way of dignifying placement over the, the teleological endpoint of an argument. And so I'm not valuing, with this method, I am not valuing the destination, which comes when an argument finishes its grand march. But I'm saying that there is, a, there is something about exact placement and that the way, if you have a paragraph, which is therefore like a canvas or a box or a thing that you can judge from its perimeters, you can, every piece in the paragraph has a relation to the beginning, the end, and the sides and the middle. And so that you can create in a way um, arguments that are argued by virtue of juxtaposition and placement. I mean, I guess I'm, and then you can also do with the paragraph these tricks of juxtaposition. So you're not, um, and it, this saves me from saying A causes B. It saves me from ergo. And it, it, instead I can say, you know, this glass is next to this watch in this room. You know, maybe there are more profound things to say than this gla glass is next to this watch. But I don't want to say, because I'm thirsty, I seek termination through forward motion. Also, why does everything have to be equally profound? I mean, I don't know. There's, there's nothing, or, or what is, you know, of course, it's, there's something that, of course, there's a profundity to the, you know, the 
there's a beautiful moment when you read Hegel. I'm not going to actually <laughs> read it here, but it's... Uh, it's a good sentence. It's Hegel's sentence, not mine, but I do like that. But then you do your thing with Hegel, which is like, it's, it's, it's a unbelievably beautiful moment of juxtaposition. Actually, maybe I will read it. I don't know. For Hegel's sake. For Hegel's sake. Um, so 171. It's, this is in punctuation. You start off with one of my favorite uh, uh, opening lines of any crop I've ever read. Um, mm -hmm. To fail at totality, exclamation point. <laughs> um, I went through a phase a few years ago of reading philosophy. I didn't make it very far, however, through Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. I stopped after finishing the preface subtitled on scientific cognition. My time for reading Hegel will come. Cognition, after all, is one of my favorite words and was not the, sub the spellbound state that I described earlier, an example of sublation whereby depleted resources reinterpret themselves as power and rise up to declare the right of frost, the right to be seized by frost and to declare frost a higher form of ardor Hegel, now we're quoting Hegel, starting from the subject as though this were a permanent ground, it finds that since the predicate is really the substance, the subject has passed over into the predicate and by this very fact has been sublated. And since in this way, what seems to be the predicate has become the whole and the independent mass, thinking cannot roam at will, but is impeded by this weight. And then you go on, I can picture the subject passing over into the predicate. I imagined the subject as a night wanderer, like the heroine of Charlotte Bronte's Villette, in a somnambulistic trance, prowling through a fictionalized Brussels. Once, I behaved like Hegel's subject. On a camping trip in sixth grade, I sleepwalked into an adjacent campsite and entered the sleeping bag of a boy I didn't know. I told him, get out of my sleeping bag. With these magic words of exile, I woke up. Which is one of the most beautiful readings of Hegel I've ever heard. I've ever, I've ever heard. And, it, and you're, you're taking him apart in this way that is this also honoring him. Like it's, it's saying like, this is how I read Hegel and I'm gonna offer you my own, uh, my own way in and it's, it's, it's a completely legitimate way into Hegel. <laughs> it like works perfectly. Um, and it's just a crop. It's just one crop in this like large essay about punctuation where you sort of dismantle Hegel for us. Um, and it's, it's funny because of course the crop can be such, it can feel like, um, well, you just move on to the next crop. So you can kind of be like, oh, well next crop. But then you're like, wait, I could just sit with that crowd for like a year, you know why? <laughs> like, um, so it's it's a very it's a really I don't know it's I I don't want to like maybe you have something to say to that. <laughs> no, no, I just I'm so glad that you pointed it. I the part I like about this still this paragraph I do like that I begin saying to fail at totality exclamation mark because I'm not saying I have failed at totality. I'm in a way staging this moment of being wonderstruck by the possibility of feeling a totality. I'm not judging it one way or another. I think I feel in my kind of adolescent fervor of to fail at totality. I'm saying like, what a splendid fate, greater than fireworks, you know, greater than Warhol's Chelsea Girls, to fail at totality. And then I, I disavow any knowledge of Hegel, which is true. And then I take the sentence and um, I take it seriously, which means I travel with it to a place I know, which is this association to Charlotte Bronte's sleepwalking scene. And then I'm sure within the writing of this unplanned, I remember sleepwalking in sixth grade and I felt the urge to disclose it. And then at the end of the paragraph, I could say, I woke up, which is kind of not to be pedantic about this. It's like Benjamin and his 
or you know, rev, the whole thing about revolutionary juxtapositions is that you want to wake up. That that's the the the, the aim of of surrealist juxtapositions is to is through shock to wake up. And so I was so happy that through Hegel, I modernized Hegel there in a way to stage a waking up. And I, I would argue that kind of like my um, ethos of essay writing comes from not approaching the essay as a memoir about sleepwalking, which would be a perfectly good thing to do, but to stumble on the scene of sleepwalking and to treat it in a way with the, um, the set of tongs or the a sense of the estrangement effect of the bitten buttock. It's just how strange I slip walk. I'm not saying I was traumatized by it. I'm not saying anything about it except I'm shocking myself, I'm goosing myself a little bit with the sudden upsurge of that memory. Yeah. And by not explaining it too much, it means I can bring it up later in my next book. <laughs> I probably will. Is there such a thing as I mean, what so is there a bad juxtaposition? Or how do you how do you judge juxtapositions? Like I mean, obviously you're also ordering these things. So mm -hmm. it's it's not like it's it, it, you know, it's none of this is accidental. So what how do you choose that you're going to like how do you choose how do you decide on those moments of uh of friction or not? Well, no, it's interesting in that, that essay, because it preceded by a rule, there was a strict rule that there would be um, 26 paragraphs, that each paragraph would take a sentence from a book by a writer um, whose last name was A, then B, then C, then D. But I would take all those books, I would choose those passages from the books I have here in my library in Germantown, which is a more limited collection. And I would move, and so I started for A, I thought, okay, hmm, let me look through my A's. I think, how about Hannah Arendt, um, Eichmann in Jerusalem? I'll start there to kind of raise the stakes for the essay. And once I started there, I think then the next one was um, probably Benjamin. Yeah, it is. Then I was stuck. Then it was a matter of honoring, honoring the gravity of what I had, unconsciously stumbled on with this procedure. Um, you know, so that, that in, in other cases, in other kinds of writing, I would be having to make, well, I would have be having to make like other decisions, like I don't like this paragraph, it's gonna be cut. And in this case, it was as if each time I finished a paragraph, I walked downstairs and I looked for the book that would answer the previous paragraph like what come what's number what's c we have hannah Arendt, then we have benjamin and then we have Ciaran, em Ciaran, Ciaran, yes who says the middle ages were pregnant with god so i was the train had had left the station headed to a very grim destination <laughs> yeah then you have de Ross. <laughs> yeah, how did, there's not much, there's nothing lighthearted in this mix, is there? Um, Jane Jacobs, that's a sweet one. No, I, you know, it's, yeah, it's, so here you had, here you had, um, you had a set of rules to guide you through. In another instance, where do you draw the line? Is it just instinct? Do you have, do you always have sets of rules for, how you go about this, or is this something that? Well, one rule that I have that I've said before in, a, in an essay in my 1980s, an, an essay called Plato Fun Factory Poetics, I say that I revise each piece of prose nine times. I sometimes revise it more, but I usually try to go through something like nine revisions, not because I want to, but because I know that it's going to take that many goings through to, to to get rid of the bad juxtapositions as best as I can. And when I each draft, what I do is I, I print it out and I read it. And there are parts that appall me and depress me and there are parts that I like. And I just, I try to improve the parts that appall me or throw them out. And I, I try to like 
you know, load it as densely as possible with bits that I like. And when it reaches a certain density, then I think it's done. So it's in a way I weigh by density of juxtapositions rather than, um, yeah, I, like I'm doing again, I'm doing a kind of a density check over the whole piece to see if each sentence holds its weight. But it's a kind of objective thing. I'm not, again, thinking about argument so much as I'm thinking of weight. The way you, I would in a poem when you look line by line and you ask, is each line mattering enough to be a line? Yeah. Or you talk about weight shifting in your piano piece, that this important yeah. instruction from your piano teacher. Yeah, going weight transfer. Yeah, weight transfer. Weight yeah, transfer. weight transfer. That was my teacher's thing. And I think she got it from Tobias Maffei, a great piano teacher in the past, so you don't play each note individually, unless you want staccato or sforzando, but that you, in legato passages, you let the weight, you let the hand in a way rock and transfer the weight from finger to finger for a kind of, that's how you achieve legato. I don't know that I can say that I always do that, but I have a very great sense from childhood of understanding that there was something called weight transfer had to do with the distribution of energy across the phrase and that it had to be secret and seamless. You can see that that attention to weight transfer throughout this entire book. I mean, it's actually insane. It's kind of, it's, it's like you, you feel it, you feel it. I mean, there's, you know, I, I don't want to like reduce these things by calling language musical, which also musical is a, is, is a, a no-no. No. ideology. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, but, you know, every single sentence in this book feels X, feels considered in the sense that it's, it is thinking about its relationship to the other things that have come before and are coming after. And that sets up this kind of uh, very uh, exciting and uh, it actually, it, it, it both takes a certain responsibility off the reader because of course you can enjoy it, but well, that's, that's the wrong way. It's, but it also, I feel like as a reader, I, I suddenly like, oh God, like I have to be so attentive to this because it's so, I don't want to miss a beat because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's all been, it's all, it's all there for me to like figure out. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm curious how you came with the title essay, Figure It Out, which is unpublished, except this is its first time being in print, which is, um, it's a series of, uh, their assignments, they're, they're, or they're like, uh, you have a lot of assignments in this book, but this is a very, um, um, you're telling us what to do. There's no, and there's no warning as to why you're telling us to do these things. <laughs> um, it just starts with desecrate. That's the first word, it's number one, desecrate. Um, commit an iconoclastic act, gently ruin an object, a place, a possession. Take a fingernail clipper and scratch the wall of a public building. The post office would be a good choice. The scratch you make will be very tiny and therefore not entirely illegal. Not entirely illegal. The scratch won't interfere with the mail delivery. And so you don't need to feel guilty afterward. You know what's scary about that? I reread that paragraph very recently. My, and I thought when I wrote that, the po we knew this post office had problems, but we didn't know that we had reached a political point where the post office might no longer exist. And so I, 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 that paragraph was written with a kind of complacent certainty that, well, of course, there's always going to be a post office. Nobody likes the post office. <laughs> you know, we all complain about it for many reasons, but that it's, it, its indisputability was never in question. And that, it, is, it feels like part of the how history rearranges what we make. Yeah. Well, the, the next one, number two, divide your living space or your workspace, parentheses, into areas consecrated to different activities. The internet corner, the meditation corner, the sex corner, the reading corner, the chopping celery corner, the remorse corner. These corners may all end up being the same corner but invent ways of differentiating the functions. I learned this trick from an ISN's diary. I mean, that's, I can't read that now and not think that this is like, a, you know, that this is, you know, 
this is a logic we've all had to undergo and it's and you're you're both telling us to do it but we we're learning how to do that <laughs> you know yeah, no, I, you know, I was say the essay the title essay figured it out came because i wanted to write an advice book my own kind of advice book and i thought because i love giving assignments and i thought i'm going to write a whole book of telling people things that they can do it just seems so fun and i would have a whole chapter like about um like Elizabeth Taylor movies that you could watch to get advice on how to do things. But I could just do it based on stars, an Agnes Moorhead chapter, and how you could do, how you could get advice from an Agnes Moorhead movie. Or frankly, it could be just on Bewitched. There could be a whole book. Advice from, um, what's her name? What's, what's the, Agnes Moorhead's name? Whatever she is, the beautiful, amazing witch. Um, I could do that. So, um, and I wrote this essay as a kind of, a proposal, a book proposal, and I, I, it ended on such a rancorous and bitter and antisocial note that I felt like I had, um, that I was writing some kind of devil's handbook rather than something that would uplift anyone. So I said, I don't want to write an advice book. I'm too, um, not misanthropic, but too, uh, my sense of the relational is too damaged and or too um, contingent on ideal circumstances for me to be a trustworthy hand holder to others. But isn't that exactly why you're a trustworthy hand holder? Because you're as misanthropic as any of us and you were, mm -hmm. I don't know, like that's, that's why I trust you. I mean, that's, yeah. Know, I do like giving assignments and because it's the space of giving an assignment is informed by the readiness of somebody else to receive it. And so I like almost like that prelude, like, do you want an assignment? The person says, yes. And then I give the assignment, that consecrated moment of passing over um, a wish for that person's efflorescence. I like that moment a lot. I had asked you, I didn't ask you to prepare much, but I did ask if you could prepare an assignment for people who are in quarantine um, in this moment. And did you do that? Did you come up with something? No, of course I forgot, but I'm gonna, um, I would say it's kind of what I do all the time. Would, the assignment would be allegorize. Um, make an allegory of a, an object surrounding you. And I will take what I have right here. Coincidentally, I have this bottle here of the cologne I put on right before the Zoom. It's made by 19, a company called 1902 or whatever. Now the company is Berdues and it's Lavande. I bought it in New York City. And I made a little movie for Instagram called My Special Salve, where I took this bottle, I disguised it, and I pretended that this was a special anti-worry salve. And I say in the video, look it, this is my special salve and you just put a little on, I don't have any worries anymore. I'm free as a bird. I can throw away my Fitbit. You know, and I say that, so I would say, take an object around you and make a salvational allegory around it. Is, should we take questions now? Yeah, I, we can do that. I also- But yeah. you wanna ask a final, do you wanna say a final thing? No, I, well, I have so many, I mean, it's so, it's, it's so, cruel of you to bring up smells right now because I also I wanted to talk about this incredible essay of smells in the book which uh <laughs> oh wait we do have questions but okay but say there's smell thing because that's great smells there's smells in the book it's amazing and of course it's also just weird that we have this virus that is stealing people's sense of smell it's like the most I mean if you want to talk about uh, <laughs> things being rewritten as right. uh, history moves forward. It's um, that reading that essay now is particularly uh, pungent. Um, but we could- um, I would say just that the, the, the amazing thing about this, and I shouldn't say the amazing thing, but about any historical moment that interrupts um, our sense of the normal or whatever, um, brings with it this, uh, a sense of um, excessive, longing for the things that were once ordinary. Um, you know, the, 
poets are poets are often have, uh, poets in the United States have often in the past said things like oh you know like in Eastern Europe the poets are really good because they suffer or whatever but here in like bourgeois for the, among the bourgeoisie in America and the MFA programs poems aren't any good but you know which presumes that all poets in the United States are have MFAs and aren't suffering um, but, but the notion that that you can suddenly incandescently value something that you didn't even notice before. Yeah. So, so now there are questions and are we, how, how will we, Q and A. I can read them out loud to you. Um, question from uh, Mina Hamidi. Yes. So happy to see you virtually. I wanted to ask you to riff on the essay as a form. Do you think it allows for that dreamlike quality to your prose in this collection? Riff on the essay as a form. Yeah, I think um, ess essays allow a writer to dramatize the emergency of thinking in the moment. I used the word emergency before and I don't want to be banal, and, but Frank O'Hara did write a great poem called Meditations in an Emergency. Um, but the, so, something about the, the heightened pressure that any demand for organized speech makes of a wandering intelligence, that sudden demand for comprehensible, not opaque speech creates a cognitive and ethical emergency. And that an essay with its permissiveness toward the random and the unpreviously, never before juxtaposed gives a lot of room for enduring that emergency and putting it to work. Or it doesn't even need to have anything after the or. It can just be like, or period. <laughs> or period, let's just, let's do a portrait of the emergency of thinking. Let's do a portrait of it, let's not iron it out. Let's make it comestible and as friendly as possible, make it pretty stage manage it to the best of your ability, but um, let it comfort a reader who is in a state of emergency herself. Speaking of stage, can I ask you how you set the stage that you're in of this, this, of this uh, room of regression? Did you do something to alter it to make it uh, a room of launching? Not too much. I added, uh, um, I added a few little, I, I took down a few paintings that had been up here for like seven years and I put up a few things that I had done in quarantine so that they would be with me. And I think I removed some of my the clutter from my desk so that you could see my typewriter better. And I, um, that was it. I put up a few, I put up a couple more paintings and I put up more, a couple more recent ones that made me feel that this was a more current, face that I was showing to the world. I should, I should alert any, um, oh, anybody yes. who's watching that, um, that uh, Wayne is a really beautiful painter. And so these are all paintings by Wayne. I'm assuming they're all by you. They are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, if you were wondering what was, uh, what the fabulous art behind Wayne is, it's of his own making because he's not, he's, he, he, he writes and paints and I mean, that's, you also do videos, which I, that's a whole other thing which I love. But um, there's, in fact, a painting behind me of Wayne's, which I put up um, a nod to, um, to our conversation. Yeah, um, that's. <laughs> you can see a little bit. Um, what is it? Can I, can I ask what the newest? I, I just, I, we, can, we can take some more questions, but I just want to ask what is, the, what is your favorite painting on the wall behind you? Oh, that's embarrassing to say. I like, um, I probably like. Like the one, um, the the one that has an orange ground and the three ghost dancers. It's it's a it's called Ghost Dance. Ghost three ghost dancers. Parenthesis enunciation because there's a neon orange, a fluorescent orange bird flying from one corner of the canvas and um, greeting these three dancers. I was really happy when I made it because I, it's acrylic. Because all I have are acrylics here to paint with. And so, but I was using only transparent colors 
so that the yellow is made up of all these layers of transparent yellow. Um, and I usually just, it's kind of laziness and a love of the super saturated, but I put on opaque colors. But So I, I love it for its sudden um, advocacy of transparency. <laughs> so is there another question? Yes. Like, um, how about Daniel? Okay, yeah. does working on a painting feel more like writing an essay or writing a paragraph or like something else? This is from Daniel Lupo. Yes. Um, like writing an essay or writing a paragraph or like something else. Think about working, working on a painting um, involves a lot of problem solving, meaning the yellow is down, but now there's um, green, there's green next to it and the green and the yellow look banal together. So I have to change the green. In changing the green, I created a new problem over there. When I step back, it looks really dull and I don't see the pattern I meant to make or um, it looked better when the paint was wet, I need to fix it, or I need to, I need to put some frisket film on it and evaporate most of the painting and let certain bits stick out. So it's like, it's problem solving that involves in, intelligence and logic and aesthetic and intellectual issues, but it's not carried out in words, it's carried out in issues of what happens next. And in writing, because there are words, there's a conflict between procedural questions that are problem solving and questions of content and the sense of bombardment that makes writing or thinking an emergency is that each, each bit of content comes trailing a new set of words and therefore procedural problems. Like you have a thought, you're taking a walk and you have a thought and it seems like a good thought, but when you write it down, you realize that it's so clunky that it, it doesn't make sense and you have to change the thought to make it communicate. Do you, do you paint in between, like how do you time, how do you organize your time with painting and writing? What is, do you have like a rhythm to your creative activities in that way? Um, it, depends on, it depends on what's asked of me and what I ask of myself, like what's due, or what I, what I accept as a writing task. And then when a writing project demands a lot of time, then I do that. And when I feel that there's a chance for escape, or when I'm becoming too unpleasant to live with myself, I know I have to paint and become um, practical again. Like practical in the sense of I'm running out of pyrrole orange. I don't want to use cadmium orange because I'll die if I use it. So, and, you know, and I'm out of pyrrole orange. Why don't I try a lizarin orange or whatever? And I say, no, that just looks like plum or something. You know, like this constant set of corrections often having to do with color and line. And, in, you know, writing is the same. You look at a piece of something that you've written and it's just awful and you have to fix it. I look though, I will, this is the last thing I'll say about that. I look at my own writing with a sense often of distaste and disgust. It's very genuine and painful, but painting, I, I'm more accepting of it because of the voluptuousness of the color. So when I see, should we take, any more questions or should we just what do you think i don't know Wayne. i well there's there are more questions i uh i'm you know i i leave it up to you it's it's now it well here's the question i'm going to answer here's the question from john Heyman kim about whether my writing is connected to the methods of writing and the legacy of nouveau roman and and all that in french contemporary literature um I would say that this isn't exactly con contemporary literature, but I would say that um, the figures of Hervé Guibert, Jean Genet, André Gide from way back, Georges Perec, Proust, Mallarmé as the founder of this whole procedure of opacity, um, uh, 
Pinget, P-I-N-G-E-T, Blanchot's novels. Um, and and, and Annie, Annie Ernaux um, are all writers, contemporary or not, <clears throat> French writers who are enormously important to me in everything I write. And Robe Grier, in terms of the Nouveau Roman, Robe Grier's little book towards something like toward a new novel or something like that. And Marguerite Duras, Duras, Marguerite Duras, incredibly important. <laughs> Usually, the, and I would say many of these figures, except for Proust, Mallarmé, and Genet, interest me because of their procedures of subtraction rather than addition. Dura, for example, the, um, the processes of, of taking away. Above them all, though, are Francis Pange and Michel Leris. Pange for his siding with things, um, and Leris for his siding with the, uh, the grammar of memory and the grammar of corporeal, um, the, the way the, that one's own body in one's history comes to one through words. So David, I'm going to, I think it's, we've reached like a nice point of ending. I'm going to just say first, I want to thank everybody at Soft Skull. They are the best publisher. They're really amazing publishers, all of you. Um, and I want to thank you, David, and congratulate you on the newest issue of Art Form and particularly on your editor's letter, which does such a great job of offering consolation and uplift. <laughs> there are amazing pieces in this new issue of Art Form about the larger thinking that needs to be done about the human and the not human. Um, People really showed up. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And thanks to Powerhouse. Thank you, and thank you to Powerhouse, and thank you to Wayne. And honestly, like I don't know, I'm not. I'm going to show for this book. It's I. It's the greatest joy I've had this entire quarantine is reading this book. So I, I go buy it. Whatever you're here, you should buy it. If you're here, you should you should own this book. I don't know why you're not looking at it right now. I don't know why you haven't already bought it. And you can find it on the Powerhouse. Um, you can find it on. I'm sure maybe they've even put the link in the chat. Here's Chris to tell us how to buy the book, right? Yes, the link is in the chat. Uh, it's 10% off for the next day. Uh, and buy it. Uh, thank you, Wayne. And thank you, David. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, very, okay. very happy to host. Okay. Uh, Bye. Bye. Thanks for uh, your people. <laughs> Bye. Charlie, there we go. Okay.